Here are five more underrated but awesome subclasses in D&D. Knowledge Domain Clerics Yes, the nerdiest game in the world, D&D, has a dedicated nerd subclass, and it's actually really good. To start, you're just great at doing things. Knowledge Domain Clerics get expertise in two skills from this list at level one. This concept rolls into your channel divinity as well. As an action, you choose one skill or tool, and for 10 minutes, you get proficiency with it. Instant stealth proficiency if you're sneaking, or athletics proficiency if you're gonna suplex a fool is awesome, but the tools are the real sleeper hit here. Thieves tools for lock picking, disguise kit for disguising, cook's utensils for whipping up a healthy meal. There's a ton of mechanically powerful and roleplay awesome stuff you can do here. Oh yeah, and you also get great domain spells. Command is basically mind control, and suggestion is literally mind control. Having them both always prepared is awesome. At 6th level, you get Channel Divinity Read Thoughts. A creature within 60 feet of you makes a wisdom save, and if they fail, you can read their surface mind, what they're thinking about, their emotional state, that kind of thing. This lasts for one minute, and you can end the effect at any time to autocast Suggestion, which will automatically succeed and doesn't cost a spell slot. At 8th level, Potent Spellcasting gives you a plus 5 to your cantrip damage, and suddenly Toll the Dead is dealing 2d 12 plus 5. Pretty good considering it's free, leaving more spells for mind control. Finally, at level 17, you get visions of the past. Once per long rest, you can spend one minute meditating to see shadowy glimpses of the recent past around an object or a place. It basically makes you the best detective ever. You are Nerd Batman. So, Robin basically. Not only are knowledge domains powerful and flavorful, but they're also like the DM's favorite subclass ever. Any exposition can be weaved naturally into the story through mind reading or visions of the recent past. The adventure never stops. The nerd cleric will Sherlock Holmes this thing and find a way forward. That's awesome, especially in campaigns with tons of lore and deep world building. Beast Barbarian. The Beast Barb is underrated because despite being awesome, it's still only the second best animal themed barbarian subclass. Yes, totem barbarians are insane, we know, but just because they are kind of broken doesn't mean other options can't also be really good. Each time Beast Barb's raged, you get to transform werewolf style, manifesting a natural weapon that uses your strength modifier, claws, tail, or bite. Your bite attack deals 1d8 piercing damage and regains a little bit of hit points once per turn when you hit someone. Your claws give you an additional attack once per attack action, as long as both of your hands are empty, with each claw dealing 1d6 damage each. Tail gives you a reach attack, so you can hit from 10 feet away, dealing 1d8 piercing damage. Also, if a creature within 10 feet of you hits you with an attack, you can use a reaction to swipe your tail, adding 1d8 to your AC, potentially causing that attack to miss. All of these are great, and you get to choose each time you rage which one you have. So you can mix things up if you want a change of pace, or if the situation calls for it. Then at 6th level, all your beast form attacks become magical, and you get the power to adapt your form to suit your surroundings. When you finish a short or long rest, you can choose one of these benefits to have until your next rest. Swim speed. You gain a swim speed equal to your walking speed, and you can breathe underwater. Climb speed. You gain a climb speed equal to your walking speed, and you can climb upside down on ceilings and on difficult surfaces without needing to make a check. Jump. When you jump, you can make an athletics check and extend your jump by a number of feet equal to that check's total. Not gonna lie, this one's pretty bad compared to the others. Still, the versatility of getting to pick the one you want after every single rest and the flavor of being this ever-shifting, adapting monster is really cool. At 10th level, you get Infectious Fury. When you hit a creature with a natural weapon attack while in beast form, they need to make a wisdom save or be cursed with one of the following effects of your choice. First option, the creature uses their reaction to make a melee attack against a creature of your choice that you can see. This is funny, forcing enemies to attack each other, but it could also be really good against an enemy spellcaster, forcing them to waste their reaction on a weak melee attack so your party can force through a powerful spell without getting counterspelled. 
Second option, the target takes 2d12 psychic damage. Honestly, this is the one you'll use most of the time. That's pretty good damage. You can curse creatures this way a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. Finally, at level 14, you get Call the Hunt. When you rage, you choose willing creatures within 30 feet of you equal to your constitution modifier, and you gain five temporary hit points for each one. Then all of those creatures get to add 1d6 damage to one damage roll per turn. You can use this feature your PB times per long rest, which basically means every time you're rage, you're going to be turning the team into a beast squad and kicking ass as a pack. If you want to play a powerful barbarian that really ties flavor and game mechanics together, this is the best option out there. To continue the serious content lately, here's a serious ad. Come on, we got to get back! Where's Jimmy? Tommy! Tommy! Oh God, Jim! <coughs> they got me, Tommy. The bastards got me. You're gonna be okay, Jim. You, you're gonna go home. You've got a baby girl who needs you to get home. Ah, it's too late, Tommy. Just, just promise me one thing. What is it? Get the Wormwood Modular Gaming Table. What? The modular gaming table is a beautiful hardwood dining or coffee table that also functions as a perfect board game station for D&D and other hobbies. It features a felt-lined interior and is covered with a spill-resistant magnetic topper to keep the games inside safe while not in use. There's a bunch of different sizes to choose from, all top-notch American craftsmanship and a ton of innovative magnetic accessories out now on Kickstarter. I'll do it, Jim. I'll get the Wormwood Modular Gaming Table. And remember, Tommy, the earliest pledges get the fastest delivery, so order soon. Jimmy! Jimmy! No! <laughs> this serious ad was brought to you by Wormwood. Kickstarter link in description. Way of the Ascendant Dragon Monk. Dragon Monks are just one of those classes you've got to see to appreciate. When they came out, a lot of people thought they were bad. It didn't help that their name shortened to the Way of the Ass, but hold up, these guys are packing heat. When you take this subclass at third level, you instantly get four benefits. Dragon Strike. You can swap out the damage of each unarmed strike you make to your choice of acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison damage. Dragon Presence. Whenever you fail an intimidation or persuasion check, you can use your reaction to re-roll. You can only do this once per long rest, but here's the thing. It only counts as being used if your new roll is successful. So if you fail, it's not wasted and you can still use it later. Tongue of Dragons lets you learn Draconic or one other language of your choice. And finally, there's Breath of the Dragon. This lets you replace one of your attacks each turn with a 30-foot line or 20-foot cone breath weapon attack. You pick a damage type from this list and each creature in the range of your attack needs to make a dexterity saving throw or take damage equal to two rolls of your martial arts die or half as much on a successful save. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you get them all back on a long rest, and if you don't have any uses remaining, you can spend two key points to do it again. Sure, the damage isn't crazy, but this only replaces one of your attacks, so at level 5 you can let loose a burst of flame and then charge through and still attack three more times that turn. At 6th level you get Wings Unfurled. Whenever you use your bonus action to Step of the Wind at the cost of a key point to dash, you gain a fly speed as you unfurl Spectral Wings until the end of turn. You can only do this your PB amount of times per long rest, which is a shame because you're already spending a key point to do it. It. Still, 70 feet of fly speed is very good, even if it does cost a bonus action. At 11th level, you get Aspect of the Worm. As a bonus action, you create an aura of draconic power that radiates 10 feet from you for one minute. You get one of the following benefits when you use this ability. Frightful Presence lets you choose one creature in your aura, and if they fail a wisdom save, they are frightened of you for the next minute. 
Not bad. Resistance lets you choose a damage type from this list, and you and the allies in your aura have resistance to that damage type. This is insane if you're fighting a specifically elemental monster, like a red dragon for instance, because it basically doubles everyone's hit points. You can create this aura for free once per long rest, or you can spend three key points to create it at any time. Finally, at 17th level, you get Ascendant Aspect, a permanent buff that gives the following benefits. Augment Breath. You can use one key point when you use your Breath of the Dragon feature to triple its size and double its damage to four rolls of your martial arts die. Blindsight. You gain Blindsight out to 10 feet. Simple, but good. And then there's Explosive Fury. When you activate your Aspect of the Worm feature, you can choose any creatures in that aura and force them to make a Dexterity saving throw. They take 3d10 acid, fire, lightning, cold, or poison damage on a failed save. Pretty good way to start a fight, running into a group of enemies and exploding. So ass monks basically get a ton of awesome options at the cost of each one being limited use per day. Sure, you only get your proficiency bonus worth of dragon's breath, but you can also fly equal to your proficiency bonus, and you can create this aura, and you can re-roll your intimidation checks. You're pretty much always gonna have something cool you can do, and you can use key points to reactivate some of your abilities if you really have to. Plus, dragons are cool. It, it, it's right there in the name of the game, guys. Come on. Enchantment Wizard. Damn, there are a lot of wizards out there. So a few of the really cool ones are inevitably going to get pushed to the side in favor of the flashy options, like Blade Singers or Divination Wizards. But don't sleep on Enchantment Wizards. Or, or try not to anyway. I mean, a lot of them do like to cast the spell Sleep. Starting at level 2, you only need to spend half the golden time usually required to copy an enchantment spell into your spell book. And considering enchantment spells are some of the best spells in the game, that's pretty good. But the real fancy feature is Hypnotic Gaze, which I misheard the first time someone said, I use my Hypnotic Gaze, and I was like, you got some Hypnotic Gay guys back there? This can't be real, right? This is, this is homebrew. Anyway, Hypnotic Gaze lets you use an action to magically enthrall a creature within five feet. They make a wisdom save, and on a fail, they are charmed, incapacitated, and their movement falls to zero. Basically, they can't do anything. Then you can extend this effect as long as you want by using your action each turn to maintain it and staying within five feet of your target. If the target takes damage, the effect ends, but otherwise it's a permanent lockdown for just one failed save. Your allies can tie up the creature or stuff them into a bag of devouring. As long as it doesn't actually take damage, it's trapped. Yeah, this one especially is totally broken with the right items to back it up. The only downside is you have to get within five feet of an enemy creature to try this, so have Misty Step on hand in case it doesn't work. At sixth level, you get Instinctive Charm. Whenever a creature within 30 feet tries to attack you, before you know whether it's a hit or a miss, you can use your reaction to change that attack to target someone else. The attacker makes a wisdom save, and if they fail, they instead attack the creature nearest to them that isn't themselves or you. So obviously, you're going to want to use this one to force enemies to attack each other and protect yourself. Just remember that it doesn't work on enemies who can't be charmed. At 10th level, you get Split Enchantment. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell that targets only one creature, you can instead target two creatures with that spell. This is amazing. Double Dominate Person or Hold Monster or even Power Word Kill is no joke. Finally, there's Alter Memories, and this is the one that really makes me love this subclass. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell on one or more creatures, you can make one of those creatures forget that it was ever charmed. Also, once before the spell ends, you can use an action to make the creature forget some of the time it spent charmed. They make an intelligent save, and on a fail, they lose memory of a number of hours of time equal to your charisma modifier plus one. This is pure roleplay. You can dominate a guard and force them to assassinate the king, and then make them forget they were charmed, and forget they ever did the murder. You can suggest a prince gives you his prized steed, and then forget he ever did so. It's just crazy fun, and rewards creativity and unusual approaches to solving problems. If you like your D&D to be more than just attacking creatures and grinding through combat, Enchantment Wizards are definitely an S-tier choice. They're as powerful as the strongest wizard subclasses in a much more subtle way. 
College of Spirits Bard. These bards are all about storytelling and spirits. The ghost kind, not the alcohol kind. At third level, you get the Guidance Cantrip, best cantrip in 5e with an extended range of 60 feet. You can also use a terrifying object like a skull or a spirit board or a, a, a candle as your spellcasting focus. Are candles scary? I don't know. Most importantly though, you get Tales from Beyond, letting you reach out to spirits who tell their stories through you. You can use a bonus action and a bardic inspiration die to roll on the spirit table, a table of stories that the spirits direct you to share. Each story has a different power, so you're basically rolling your inspiration die for a random effect that you can later use as an action. The cool thing is that as your bardic inspiration die gets bigger as you level up as a bard, the number of stories you unlock also grows, and they get more powerful. The stories do stuff like give a creature advantage on all wisdom, intelligence, and charisma saves for one minute, or give out a load of temporary hit points, or even damage and stun a creature for a full round. They're all decent, but because you can't choose the one you get, it forces you to do the work to make your spirit story powerful, always pushing you to approach combat differently. This makes the College of Spirits difficult to play optimally, but super rewarding for ambitious or experienced players. At level 6, you get to perform a ritual, basically a seance where you and the boys crack open a cold one and you learn any divination or necromancy spell until your next long rest. The only catch is it has to be of a level equal to or less than the number of people who joined in the ritual, so roleplay will often come into this if you're trying to grab some high level spells late in the game. Also at 6th level, any time you cast a bard spell that deals damage or heals, you can roll 1d6 and add that to the damage roll or the healing roll. It's a cute little buff. Finally, at level 14, you get Mystical Connection. Now, whenever you roll on the spirit table, you roll twice and choose the result you want. And if both dice are the same, you instead get to choose the story you tell, letting you pick the best one for the current situation. This just makes the whole build more reliable, which on a chaotic subclass like this comes in really handy. All in, these bards feel a lot like the Wild Magic Sorcerer. Super chaotic, super flavorful, and really fun. If you're a gambler or you like adding a little randomness to your gameplay, the Spirits Bard is going to be the one for you. This month marks the one year anniversary of the DM Secret Weapon magazine, and to celebrate, you can get an epic bumper pack of all the past 12 issues in one place at a huge discount and two free bonus adventures. That's over 600 pages of amazing stuff, over 80 new maps, 12 new subclasses, 12 new races, and 14 ready-to-play adventures. Plus a bunch of rules expansions to the game, and feats and spells and other awesome stuff. Check that out at dndshorts.com, link up here and also down there. And remember, you can get all future issues on Patreon as well, link in description. Remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and I'll see you next time.